We're going to begin right here in New York City, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the United States. Hospitals seeing the same surge in coronavirus cases that overwhelmed healthcare systems in China, Italy and Spain. Refrigerated trucks and tents have been stationed outside of some hospitals to hold the bodies of the dead as morgues fill up. In 24 hours on Tuesday, 13 people reportedly died at Elmhurst Hospital Center, a 545-bed public hospital in the borough of Queens. The New York Times reports, quote, in several hours on Tuesday, Dr. Ashley Bray performed chest compressions at Elmhurst Hospital Center on a woman in her 80s, a man in his 60s, and a 38-year-old who reminded the doctor of her fiancé. All had tested positive for the coronavirus and had gone into cardiac arrest. All eventually died. Dr. Bray called the situation apocalyptic. New York City is reporting 366 deaths and more than 33,000 confirmed cases, almost half of all the cases in the United States, though the number is expected to be so much higher due to the lack of tests. More than 4,000 coronavirus patients have been hospitalized in New York City. A leaked FEMA briefing shows all the more than 1,800 intensive care beds in the city are expected to be full by Friday, and the state has called for tens of thousands more ventilators, hospital beds and intensive care beds. This comes as workers at New York City hospitals report shortages of personal protective equipment as they work amidst patients with the highly contagious disease. Workers for the massive Mount Sinai health system shared photos online of themselves wearing trash bags for protection. A New York City nurse who was treating coronavirus patients has died after testing positive about two weeks ago. Mount Sinai West nursing manager Caius Jordan Kelly was in her 40s, and his co-workers described him as a compassionate devoted to his patients. For more, we're joined by Dr. Craig Spencer. He is director of global health and emergency medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Spencer contracted Ebola while fighting its outbreak in Africa and survived the disease. He's now an emergency room doctor in New York City where he's treating coronavirus patients. He's also on the board of Doctors Without Borders. And again, with us, our co-host, Nermeen Sheikh. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Dr. Craig Spencer, describe a day in the New York City hospitals. We just laid out this graphic picture of shortage. And the question is, how unnecessary was this, the idea that in this country, the richest in the world, doctors, people like you and nurses and the staff of the hospitals going to those who even clean the hospitals, do not have access to the necessary protection to treat the patients that are surging into these hospitals? Thanks for having me on, and let me share the story. Um, look, it's it's pretty dire inside New York City hospitals right now, and we're all concerned about how that's going to spread throughout the rest of the country, and more frankly, the rest of the world. Um, it's no surprise that the greatest number of cases are being reported in the places with the strongest or the you know the the, the best healthcare systems. Um, we know that cases are spreading all over the world. Uh, we're just picking them up more here, and we're seeing a lot more of the complications inside of our emergency departments. As has already been reported, we have a growing number of patients coming in every day with coronavirus. We have people young and old with complications, without complications, who, who get put on mechanical ventilators, who get put on life support to help their breathing, um, who have cardiac arrest. It's, it's a daily reality for many of my colleagues on the front line, especially here in New York City. Nermeen. I'd like to ask you, Dr. Spencer, I mean, one of the things, as Amy mentioned, uh, that's very striking is that, you know, the U.S. is, of course, extremely uh, uh, wealthy, the wealthiest country in the world. Uh, but it also has, according to the Global Health Security Index, in 2019, the U.S. was the highest ranked country in terms mm -hmm. of uh, pandemic preparedness. Uh, the U.S. was the best prepared. So if American hospitals are being overwhelmed in this way, what about all of the other countries um, that don't have the resources that the, that the U.S. does? Yeah. yeah. I think if you asked anyone over the past couple of years whether anyone that does this for a living, whether or not the U.S. was prepared for a pandemic, we all would have said no. I think all of us have written articles in the past couple of years lamenting the fact that the U.S. has torn apart the preparedness 
um, architecture here in the U.S. by underfunding the CDC, by underfunding state and local departments of health. Um, it's not surprising to anyone that's that, that's been looking at this or been worrying about this over the past couple of years that this pandemic is is wreaking such havoc here in the U.S. Um, we've also, you know, drastically underfunded the World Health Organization despite the lessons we learned in West Africa in 2014 to 2016 with the, the Ebola crisis there. We learned that having preparedness was much more important than a reactive response. We learned that putting the right amount of funding into the organizations who are capable of picking up these, uh, these disease threats and responding to them all over the world is the only way to protect people everywhere. It is so much cheaper, it is so much cheaper to invest in preparedness than it is to, to scramble for response. We're putting, we're putting together trillions of dollars to, to try and respond to this just here in the United States. And that amount of money would have provided for global preparedness for over a decade. And so we need to really think about our priorities. And I hope when we come out on the other side of this, we think about where the smart investment is. A smart investment is not just trying to build a wall around this country and with the hope that we're going to keep microbes and bacteria out. The reality of our world right now is that wherever disease starts, and it's more likely to be in China than it is to be in Columbia, Missouri, um, it can be with anywhere in the world within 24 to 48 hours, and we are all at risk unless we have strong health systems in the places where the most vulnerable patients are. And Dr. Spencer, can you explain for, for people who don't uh, uh, know, uh, the people think, I mean, in the U.S., most health care is privatized. So why is it that in private hospitals, uh, there is not sufficient, there isn't sufficient personal protective equipment because not funding the CDC or cutting funding to the CDC, et cetera, shouldn't impact the decisions that private hospitals make about the, equip the equipment, the beds, et cetera, that they acquire. Yeah. You know, it's funny because we talk about these N95 masks. Those are those thicker um, variants that filter particles like the coronavirus. Um, and generally, we're fit tested in the hospital every year it's a requirement to make sure that they fit right, that nothing can get through. We almost never use them because in the U.S. we don't have relatively many tuberculosis patients. We don't have a lot of people where we have to use this type of protection. Um, that's not the reality in many of the places that I work, West Africa, East Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera. Um, they're, they're just more used to a lot of the communicable diseases that we have stopped seeing as much here in the United States. The result is that a lot of my colleagues have don't have the same amount of experience of working with the personal protective equipment that we need right now. I see a lot of people who are, you know, touching the mask or putting it on or taking it off incorrectly. Personal protective equipment like gloves and masks do not protect you if they're used incorrectly. One of the greatest risks when you're using them is taking them off wrong, touching your face, touching the mask, and infecting yourself. So it's not surprising that we don't have a huge supply of these things. We didn't prepare for this scenario. And I think this is the mo most important message. So many people knew that this was coming. So many people knew that this was coming. You can look back and you can see headlines from three months ago, three years ago, Everything that we learned in West Africa seemed to have been torn apart and decisions that, you know, seemingly undermine our willingness and our, our ability to respond to pandemics, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world. Dr. Spencer, if you would take us on your personal journey, what happened to you when you were dealing with Ebola in Africa um, ha about contracting it? And then the lessons we can learn, and I want to particularly go to the issue of um, the egregious lack of tests and how that is a major public health care measure, just for people to understand. The lack of tests, how uh, the lag in getting them, and then even now the amount of time it takes for people. It can be four, five, ten days to find out, in fact, even if they get the test in New York, very difficult, and what that means in terms of contagion. But start with yourself contracting Ebola. Yeah. So I worked in West Africa, in Guinea, in 2014. I was in Gekadu, another epicenter of an outbreak, um, providing direct clinical care on a daily basis in full personal protective equipment with Doctors Without Borders. And I followed rigorous protocols every single day. 
uh, my organization had been doing this for you know decades uh, and had really done a great job in minimizing the risk to the providers and increasing the quality of care we could provide to our patients. That being said, personal protective equipment is not flawless. It's not perfect, even if used perfectly. Um, at one point, I was infected. When I came back to the U.S., I was uh, thankfully treated here and received incredible quality care and was lucky enough to survive, um, largely because I was treated in a really great health system. I was also really young and didn't have any of the medical issues, but the whole time, the only thing I could think about were my colleagues and my friends back in West Africa that didn't have access to the same quality of care. One thing I say is that in West Africa, I took care of about 30 patients myself at any time. And here in the U.S., I probably had 30 providers on call to take care of me at any time. Um, some of the stunning similarities and differences between West Africa and coronavirus is that, yeah, they're both viruses. Um, the coronavirus seems to infect more people and kill a relatively smaller percent versus Ebola. Um, but the difference in terms of the fight was that in West Africa, I at least never really had to worry about my personal protective equipment. A lot of my colleagues here in New York City are worried about the number of N95 respirators we have, how limited our supply chain is, and if it's bad here, what's it gonna look like in the rest of the country? And you bring up another really important point that we haven't talked about, I think, enough, and that is this issue of testing. Right now, we're talking about only testing certain people so only testing some healthcare workers, only testing people that are hospitalized. It's not because that's the best thing to do, because that's really the only thing we can do right now. Testing capacity has, has increased dramatically in the past couple of weeks, but we are months delayed. We should have had a testing strategy like South Korea. We need to understand where this disease is, is passing, where it's transmitting. And the only way to do that is to test, 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 and test. We haven't been doing that. We've all been limited in our hospitals and in our communities. People are walking around not, now not knowing whether or not they've had coronavirus, whether they may have some type of immunity, um, whether they could be out in our communities helping other people if they have antibodies by delivering groceries to the elderly or, or helping in other institutions. So our testing strategy right now is such because we've failed to be prepared. There were critical missteps in the testing capacity and the testing kits that were sent out there were a lot of promises about our ability to do um, billions of uh, millions of beautiful tests for anyone that wanted one. But that was never the reality on the front line, and that's completely changed in the past couple of weeks.